to the book of Luke again this morning. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, the same passage that we read the last two weeks. Two weeks ago we read verses 1 through 7. Last week we read verses 8 through 13, through 14. And this morning we're going to read verses 8 through 20. Luke chapter 2, verse 8, to start the message this morning. And there were, in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all, that, and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, and glor glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. Let's pray. Father, this morning we ask that you'll take the Word of God, and as we listen to it, as we hear the Word of God, may it cause us to have faith in you. We know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So, Father, I pray that you will work in our hearts this morning, and cause us to, to uh, just as the shepherds, to have that type of uh, wondering heart, that type of witnessing life, that type of wonderful uh, spreading of your of the good tidings of great joy. Father, I pray that you'll help us this morning uh, to be like these shepherds, and to, uh, to have this moment of peace and silence before we go out and spread your word. And Father, we thank you so much for the word of God that gives us something, that uh, gives us a type of peace that no one can take away from us, something that can help us throughout all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Silence is something that you don't find very much of in our day-to-day. -day. It's something that uh, gets drowned out by the noises of this world, isn't it? The silence to be able to think, the silence to be able to meditate on God's Word, the silence to be able to, to plan, the silence to be able to, to determine some things in life. Those types of moments are lar largely lost. Uh, so many times we don't even have a chance to uh, even write each other, write other people letters. You know, we're so busy with life. We don't have a chance to even uh, stop and think. Everything is instant. And uh, people expect instant replies. People expect instant, uh, uh, instant uh, uh, things to happen instantly. We don't have time to think about what we're going to say. But uh, in our day and age, even in the middle of all the drowning out of God's Word, we, there is still, there still can be moments, even in the chaos of Christmas time, there can, still can be moments of silence, of holiness, of prayer, of, of realizing what it's all about. And so that's what ha was happening on this very night. Now here in these fields, in Bethlehem, they didn't have any cars going by. You know, it's a little bit, if you just, if you just, uh, if we had silence right now in this room, we would still hear cars going by. Maybe we'd hear the kids in the back room. Maybe we'd hear the the uh, the heater in the back heating up the building. But uh, we might not hear as many cars with these new double glazed windows in this in the room now. But uh, but if we were to stop and, and and have silence, we we would hear a lot of things. But in the shep the shepherds in those days, they would hardly have heard anything. It was silent. 
except for maybe the sheep. And it was dark. Uh, we, we don't really know darkness because there's so many lights around us living in cities. But here in Bethlehem, I'm sure it was dark, maybe just a campfire. And all of a sudden, though, that silent night wasn't so silent anymore because there was a message from God. And uh, there was, it wasn't so dark anymore because there were angels appearing. And think of the brightness. Think of the sounds. You know, we, we aren't really shocked uh, when we read these, these verses. We aren't really surprised by it all. We've heard these verses many, many times, I'm sure. Luke chapter 2. But think of how shocking it was when it actually happened. Uh, these, these shepherds, they were, their stillness was totally... Uh, there's, there's si the silence of the night was totally interrupted by these angels. Now, uh, these angels brought a message. Let's look, look, last week we looked at what the main angel's message was in verses 10 to 12. And we said it was joy. We looked at the song, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. And we looked at that word, Good Tidings of Great Joy, in verse 10. But this morning I wanted to look at the message of this multitude of angels that joined this one angel. I don't know who the one angel was. It could have been Gabriel as, as, as uh, he was the one who brought the message to Mary and Joseph and to Zechariah. But uh, it, it could have been Michael, but it doesn't say. But then there was this multitude of angels. I don't know how many a multitude is, but all the angels. The book of 1 Peter tells us that the angels, they desire to look upon Redemption. They don't. They, they desire to look in onto these things which are happening to us, and so these angels they were thronging around when Jesus was born, and their message in verse fourteen was glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, what's the difference between joy and peace? This morning we sang "Sleep in Heavenly Peace" in Silent Night. What's the difference between joy and peace? Well, F.B. Meyer said that joy is peace, dancing, and peace is joy at rest. And so they're, they're, all, they're very similar. They're, they're, uh, uh, joy is, so, is, uh, is something that we have in our hearts that, that even through the worst circumstances, we can have joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But peace is also a fruit of the Spirit. We can have joy no matter what's happening. We can have, we can have peace in the worst of circumstances. They're but they're both distinct parts of the fruit of the Spirit. We need both at different times in life. And so, uh, peace. Peace is something that the world has long sought after. In fact, uh, there have been over 8,000 peace treaties in, in history recorded. Over 8,000 peace treaties. But have those peace treaties brought peace to the earth? Not really. Well, they, they say that... Uh, in 4,000 years of recorded history, out of those 4,000 years, there have only been 268 years of recorded peace. So uh, the world has not been a very peaceful place ever since the dawn of creation. The Society of International Law in London uh, said that, that uh, in the last three centuries alone, there have been 286 wars on the continent of Europe alone. And so that's a lot of wars. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of bloodshed. And of course, uh, Brother Rudy read to us about the song Silent Night and how there was that Christmas Day tr truce. And they sang Silent Night, Holy Night, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. But then, of course, on December 26th, they went back to shooting one another again. Why, did, why didn't that uh, song, why didn't that stop the fighting? Why didn't they go back to fighting one another after after that Christmas Day truce? Well, the answer is because not until Jesus comes back again can there truly be peace on the earth. Uh, Christmas doesn't bring peace in itself, celebrating Christmas, but the message of Christmas that Jesus is coming, that's what brings peace. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a bridge on our way back from London, and you may have seen it on, uh, on the main road from London. It says, Give Peas a Chance. You know, it's probably some mother wanting her child to eat his veggies that wrote that. I don't know who wrote that up there, but, uh, but it reminds me of uh, John Lennon. He used to say, give peace a chance. Well, people have tried to give peace a chance, but peace without Jesus stands no chance. There's no peace without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one who will bring peace to this earth. 
uh, on, a, on a house near Durham, there's a Latin inscription that says that this house was built in the year 1697 of the Peace of the Gospel, and in the first year of the Peace of Ryswick. So that was built in 1697 of the Peace of the Gospel, and the, and the first year of the Peace of Ryswick. Well, the Peace of Ryswick didn't last. I don't even know who Ryswick is, but his peace didn't last. But the Peace of the Gospel will last, and will always last. It will continue until Jesus comes again. The peace that he can give. The peace of the gospel. We sang this morning, O Holy Night. The last verse that says there, Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love. And his gospel is peace. His gospel is peace. It says, Change shall he break, for the slave is our, our brother. And in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise His holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise His name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. You know what? One day, Jesus will come back, and He will be, as Isaiah calls Him, the Prince of Peace. Turn, if you will, with me to Isaiah. Isaiah, chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and this, uh, this time period when Isaiah was writing was definitely one of, of depression. People were, Israel had had its heyday in the past, but now Israel was, was going downhill spiritually. And yet Isaiah brings this message of hope, of peace, of a, of a divine child. Let's start reading in verse number 1. It says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath, shined, hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. But then in verse 3 it switches very quickly, uh, just, as, just as the rest of the chapter switches when Jesus comes. It says, they haven't increased the joy, but then after the semicolon it says, They joy before thee, according to the joy in harvest, and as men when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Verse 5, For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the child that was born that day. Now, so many times we get lost. We don't have peace. I, I try to think of the, of the moment in your life when you had when you were the most panicked. That's the opposite of peace. I remember when I was uh, going camping with my parents. We went to Arkansas. We were on our way to the Grand Canyon. We stopped in Arkansas for the night. And uh, our dog would, went off into the woods chasing a deer. We, we set up the pop-up camper, and the dog just went straight off into the woods. And Dad said, go get her. We're going to get fined a huge, a huge uh, fine if she catches that deer. And so uh, I went off into the woods chasing the dog, and uh, I couldn't find her. But before I knew it, I had crossed the log over this little creek in the woods. And before I knew it, I had no idea where I was. I was totally lost in the middle of the Ozark Mountains. I'd never been there before. And uh, I, I, I ran 20 yards one way, then I ran 20 yards the other way, then the other way, and I had no idea where I was. And uh, there was no, no, nothing I could do. And so I, and, and, and the sun was going down. And it, before I knew it, it was pitch black. It was dark. And I was lost. And so all I could do is walk somewhere. So I just started walking and listening, and in, in the silence of the woods, I finally 
heard something, and I heard my father yelling my name. And he had walked, he had driven his car all the way down to the, to the main road, and he was standing there yelling my name. And so I just walked towards his voice, but by the time I got there, he had already driven away. But at least I had found the road, and uh, I was able to somehow pick a direction and get back to where some signs for the campground was. And so, anyway, that, that's kind of like uh, Israel was in those days. They were in the middle of chaos. Uh, it seemed like they were losing their way spiritually. They were lost. And so out of the darkness, out of the silence, God sent a messenger, Isaiah, to call out, Listen, this is the way you need to go. Come this way. For unto us a child is born. You need to come to him. Come to Christ. Come to him in faith. And so that's what, that's what this silent, the message of this silent night is. Sit still, be quiet, and listen to God's voice. Listen to what God has to say in the Bible. Listen to what God has to say with the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he has to say, the message of God. Through the message of God, uh, uh, the message of salvation, the message of the Christian life. Listen to that. And so uh, Isaiah is telling these people who are in despondency, I've got good news for you. Unto us a child is born. And then... Verse 6 reminds me of Luke chapter 2. He says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That was the day. That it was, it's for us. And we talked last week about how it's for us. You know, there's, uh, there's ne uh, after Jesus Christ, there's no other recorded birth in Scripture uh, except for the, after, after the birth of Jesus. There's no other genealogies after the genealogy of Jesus. There's lots of births recorded in the Old Testament, but after Jesus, there's no more. But why? Because all of Scripture was building up to the moment when Jesus was born. All the genealogies, all the story, the red crimson line through the Old Testament was all pointing to this one birth, Jesus' birth. No, uh, nobody else needs, uh, needs to, uh, nothing else, nobody else needs to come. No, nobody else needs to be added to what Jesus did. Nothing can be added to what Jesus did. And then in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 2, he's there. Now, they were in darkness. Isaiah chapter 9 talks about how the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Darkness. You know, uh, Brother uh, Antony uh, at uh, the church in Hinckley, he preached a great message about light from this passage when we went to their carol service. And he talked about how he preached from, uh, from verse number 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. He says... We see all these Christmas lights twinkling everywhere. But what, why? What do they mean? They remind us that in the darkness, Jesus came. He broke the darkness. Those angels broke the darkness with that message of light. In verse number 1, it talks about the dimness. And uh, it talks about, uh, it talks about, verse 2, it talks about the land of the shadow of death. Think about the dimness, the darkness, the shadow of death. And that's what Jesus came into. We live in the land of a shadow of death. We live in a land of sin. We live in a land that has, that has been uh, cursed by sin. In Psalm 23, it talks about the valley of the shadow of death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's why we all have to go through the, sh the valley of the shadow of death. And all this world is tainted by the shadow of death. All this world is tainted by the curse of sin. All this world is tainted by the curse that we talked about last year, enjoy to the world. The curse, the, the thorns, that far as the curse was found, Jesus came uh, to to, uh, to remove the curse. And so, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the only way to have true light. And so, uh, we see here that Jesus brought that peace. Jesus, it tells us, the Bible tells us, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Now the Lord of peace... Himself. Let, let me let me let me turn there. I only have half the verse written there, with a dot 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 after it. I guess I thought I had it could quote it, but when you get up here, you forget. Sometimes. Two Thessalonians chapter three verse sixteen. Now the Lord of peace Himself give you peace always, by all means. The Lord be with you all. He's He's not only called the Prince of Peace, but He is the Lord of Peace. Jesus Christ is the Lord of peace. Now, what is peace? Peace is peace is a quietness. Peace is a stillness in your heart. Now, the first thing I want to I want to say is that there is peace 
of a quiet conscience. Peace of a quiet conscience. When we have a quiet conscience before God, we can have peace. If you haven't had your sins forgiven, you can't have a good conscience about things. But if you've come to Christ as your Savior, your sins are gone. There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8. And also in Romans chapter 8, if you'll turn with me there. Romans chapter 8 verse 33. It says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? He asks three questions there in verses 33, 34, and 35. Verse 33, he says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody can. If you've been forgiven, if you've been justified, as it says there, nobody can lay anything to your charge. You can have a clear conscience. Then in verse 34, he asks the second question, Who is he that condemneth? The answer is, nobody can condemn you if, you're, if you've been justified. Nobody can can condemn you at all. And then he asks a third question, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer again is nobody. Nobody can separate you. Nobody can condemn you. Nobody can lay anything to your charge. Nobody can separate you from the love of Christ. You are His. And so along with verse number 1 of chapter 8, this is a wonderful chapter to say that we have a clear conscience. We have peace in our hearts. Now, Mary... Uh, Mary, she was able to have peace in her heart because she had a good conscience. Lots of people were... Uh, just imagine the chaos that must have, there must have been after Mary was found pregnant. Uh, of course, in those days, of, um, even more so than today, it was a real scandal. And so uh, she, she was found with expectant with a child, and she wasn't married. Of course, think of how people must have talked even when Jesus was older. Uh, they, they, they said, you, we know who you are, Jesus. You're the son of Mary. And the people in Nazareth, people were talking about that all of Jesus' life, the scandal of it. And yet, the, even in the midst of all the people talking about her, lying about her, gossiping about her, Mary was able to have peace in her heart because she knew she had a clear conscience. She knew she had done nothing wrong. She was, Jesus was born of a virgin, as we sing, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. There was peace there because they knew that they were in the center of God's will. If you know, you've, if you know that you're obeying God, if you know that you are in the center of God's will, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You can have peace, can't you? So there's peace from that. There's, there's peace of a quiet conscience. Even in the middle of the pain and confusion of the stable there, they were able to have that. In the difficult circumstances of life, we're able to have that. Now, <clears throat> peace doesn't always mean absence of trouble. Uh, peace, the peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble, but it is rather the confidence that is there with you, always. That's what real peace is. Matthew Henry said, Peace is such a precious jewel that I would give anything for it but the truth. And it is a precious jewel. <clears throat> a long time ago, there was a, a painting contest. Uh, somebody, a man was seeking the perfect picture of peace. And he couldn't find any picture of peace that, that, that satisfied him. So he announced a contest to produce a, a masterpiece of peace. So the challenge stirred the imagination of art, artists everywhere. And the judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another. And the viewers were all clapping and cheering. And finally, only two pictures remained. And they were veiled, and they, tensions grew. And finally, they, they pulled the curtain off of one. And it was a picture of a mirror-smooth lake reflecting lacy green birches under the soft bluish of the evening sky. Along the grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. Surely, this would be the winner. The man, uh, the man with the contest uncovered the second painting, and the crowd gasped in surprise. Could this be peace? 
It was a painting of a tumultuous waterfall cascading down a rocky precipice. The crowd could almost feel its cold penetrating spray. Stormy gray clouds threatened to explode with lightning, wind, and rain. But in the midst of the thundering noises and bitter chill, a spindly little tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the falls. One of the branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience its full power. A little bird had built a nest in the elbow of that branch. Content and undisturbed in her stormy <coughs> surroundings, she rested on her eggs. With her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones, she manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. That's the, that was the winner. And so uh, peace isn't always the absence of trouble. It's having being able to have peace in the midst of trouble. When uh, Horatio Spafford's daughters died, halfway between here and America on the ship, when the ship went down and the, the captain said, as far as we can tell, this is where the ship went down, where your daughters drowned. And he was able to stand on the bow of the ship and write those words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And that's, that's peace. Is it well with your soul? And one more story. When Nicholas Ridley, uh, when we were in Oxford, we, uh, we went to... Uh, a little, a little tour, a Christian heritage tour around Oxford, and uh, we saw the spot where the martyrs were killed. Well, on that spot, Nicholas Ridley was uh, burned at the stake. And Nicholas Ridley, uh, the night before, in 1555, the night before his execution, his brother offered to come and stay with him in his prison chamber to be of some comfort to him. But Nicholas declined the offer and replied that he meant to go to bed and sleep as quietly that he ever had in his life because he knew the peace of God and he could rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of his Lord. You know, could you have that kind of peace on the night before your death, or your martyrdom being burned at the stake? Well, he could because he said, I can rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of my Lord. Hopefully we can all have that peace, the peace of knowing Christ. Think of Jesus' peace as he lay there. A child is peaceful when they're laying in their mother's arms. Usually, I, don't have, I haven't had any children, but uh, uh, sometimes, I guess, they can be peaceful when they're laying in their mother's arms, sleeping without a care in the world. But, uh, you know, that's the way that we should be in our Father's arms. Absolute trust in the one who's above all. And of course, Jesus was just a baby, but he was still God, wasn't he? He was fully man and fully God, and he lay there in his mother's arms. I'm sure he was at perfect peace, even though he knew uh, all of the difficulties of his life ahead and the death that he would die. Uh, but there's a distinction in the Word of God. There's the source of, there's the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the nature of peace, is that it's, uh, it's a restful mind, it's a clear conscience, but then... The, uh, uh, the source of peace. The source of peace. Peace comes from God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have peace with God. There's a difference in the Bible, a distinction in the Bible between peace with God and the peace of God. I don't know if you've ever made that distinction in your mind before, but there's the peace of God. We have peace with, I mean, we have peace with God. The peace with God is because we were enemies of God. We were at war with God. You know, this world, I mentioned earlier all the wars that are going on in the world, but there can't be peace until the war is over, until peace is made. Well, Jesus, he fought the battle. The war is over. He's made peace with God through his blood through the blood of his cross. And so, being justified by faith. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? You can't have peace with God otherwise. And that's what our tract at the back says, how to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then, the second type of peace is the peace of God. And we find the peace of God in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Do you, does anybody from the Bible school remember 
where Paul was when he wrote the book of Philippians? He was in jail, that's right. He was in prison, and yet he was able to write in Philippians 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. We have peace with God, that's salvation. But then we have the peace of God, that's sanctification. That's every day of life. And we need that peace of God. He is the God of peace. <coughs> Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 33, calls Him the God of peace. So, He's the Prince of Peace, He's the Lord of Peace, and then uh, Romans 15, 33 says that He is the God of peace. He's the only one that can bring you peace. And then, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 3, 16, the Lord of Peace, it says, May He give you peace always. Always. In no, whatever circumstance. How long does this peace last? Forever. How long did the peace of Rigsby last or whatever? Not very long. How long do peace treaties last? Not very long. They're broken just a few years later. But the peace of Christ will last forever. And he will, uh, all the weapons will be turned into plowshares. As we read in Isaiah chapter 9, the war clothes will be burnt for fuel. All of those things will be passed. And there will be an everlasting peace you know, this world becomes more and more materialistic. We need God's grace and God's mercy extended to sinners. Now what? Back to Luke chapter 2 and we'll be done. Luke chapter 2 says that these shepherds, when they heard about the peace and the goodwill toward men, they went and they saw for themselves. And the Bible says that we should come and see for ourselves. Have you come to Christ? Have you seen for yourselves? In this materialistic world, you're not going to find any peace. But if you come to Jesus, you'll find God's grace, you'll find God's mercy, and you'll find peace with God. These shepherds, they came and they saw for themselves. Come to Jesus and see for yourself. The second thing we can learn is that these shepherds, they told other people about God's peace. The first evangel last week was an angel. The first evangelist. The second evangelists were shepherds. They probably didn't have a very good education. They were just out in the middle of the fields. And yet God used them to be the first evangelists. Even before John the Baptist, these shepherds were the first people that told people that Jesus had come, that the Christ had come. And so God used, in, in His wisdom, uh, it, I don't know if it's very wise to use us human, frail, frail human people, but in God's sovereignty He has chosen for us. And He is wise, He is all wise, and He's given us that Responsibility. He's entrusted this message to mankind. And our silence, when we come to Jesus, listening to His Word, our silence should then turn into singing and speaking to others. Silent nights should turn into speaking to others. And so, in verse 17, uh, it tells us, in, of Luke chapter 2, it says, And th when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And so, uh, God's spoken to us, may we speak to others, bring the good tidings of great joy to all people, as it says in this chapter. And then the last thing, it produced not only for them, it, it, didn't, it not only caused them to come and see, it not only caused them to go and tell, but the third thing, it caused them to glorify and praise God, there in verse number 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen. The night was silent. But it soon opened up into all these glorifying sounds. And may God cause our silent nights to be full of the sounds which can please Him. And, uh, it says that all the things that they had heard. And so as we've been going through these, this series of messages, the sounds of Christmas. What have you heard? Whether it's singing Christmas songs, whether it's reading. Hearing people read the, the, the Christmas message from the Bible. May it cause us to go and tell other people about it. And so as we finish up this morning, I thought we would just have just a few moments before we sing, a few moments of silence as we think about that silent night. Just maybe about 30 seconds of silence as we think, Lord, have I come and seen? Lord, have I gone and told? Lord, have I glorified you and praised you with my life? Let's have a time of prayer.
I have a poem. It says, Drop thy still dew of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Let's pray. Lord, Father God, we thank you so much for the peace that you brought to this world, the chaos of this world. So, Father, I pray that you will help us over these next four days in which the world is filled with, har uh, with hurry and rush towards Christmas. May it be our moment to drown out the noise of the world and to be filled with your peace. And then help us to become willing ambassadors speaking about your greatness, the greatness of Jesus Christ. And uh, help us to have that ministry of reconciliation, helping people to have peace with God. Father, help us, help our mouths to be filled with your praise and with your truth. Father, we thank you for that night, that silent night. Thank you for those shepherds. Thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.